Over the last few weeks, we've been discussing fundraising in uh, self-storage space for the small investor, and let's complete that this week. Uh, what I've been doing is dividing this massive world of fundraising, raising money to do self-storage deals, using other people's money, into some three basic categories. Today, let's talk about funds. My name is Mark Helm, and I'm the author of Creating Wealth Through Self-Storage, and I'm the creator of Quick Start Academy, and that houses the on-demand self-storage boot camp, which is my premier training designed to take you from wherever you are now all the way to putting your first or your next self-storage facility into service, and soon it will house a course on fundraising for the small investor in self-storage. And I broke this huge world up into three basic categories. We've talked about syndications. We've talked about joint ventures. Today I want to talk about funds, creating funds. Now, technically, there's really not a legal definition of the word uh, funds. Uh, and funds are syndications. But I relate to the world of funds very differently than I relate to the world of syndications where you're doing one one-off projects, more or less, raising money from individual investors. Funds are where, what I'm calling a fund, is primarily what we call a blind pool. In other words, people will give you money to invest in a predetermined, predefined acquisition strategy. You're gonna take this money, go out and buy or develop product. You could have apartment funds, prison funds, uh, office funds, we're going to talk about self-storage funds. In the world of funds, you can use individual investors like one-off syndications, and I've done that before. I've done syndications with individual investors putting going into a blind pool, but I relate to that still, even though technically it's not a fund, I relate to that as like syndications. Or you could have a fund, a blind pool that people can invest in where you're the investors or institutional people, or in other words, money managers, people who manage other people's money. That could be your investment pool. Now, in this series, I'm not getting into Reg A, Reg D, or the interstate exemption, Rule 147. We, we dive into that, I'm not an attorney, and we dive into that into the class, the upcoming class is gonna come out. But in what I'm calling the world of funds, I, when I relate to funds, I'm primarily relating to people who use institutional money, investing in blind pools that they raise a certain amount of money. Usually it's larger than we do in our, in our syndications, uh, 20 million, 30 million, $50 million. And then that fund is, is tasked with going out and buying product in a predetermined acquisition strategy to fulfill on the intention of that particular fund. The real question in all this, whether you're doing, when you're doing syndications and funds is, do you fall under SEC regulation? The, this is not the training for that, but in the course we go into it, and that's where a good attorney is absolutely critical because you do not want to be selling a security and not know you're selling a security. Because if you're selling a security, you've got to do certain things you don't do when you're not selling a security or when you're just raising money. So although what I'm calling a fund could also be a syndication that's not selling a security, for this episode, I'm going to assume that what I call a fund is a security. You're selling securities. Now, I've gotten to the table twice in my career, actually almost three times, but twice to do a fund and then decided not to do it, did not pull the trigger. 
Let me tell you the process one goes through when, if you're going to be doing a, what I'm calling a fund. Now I strongly advise against this approach if you're just getting in the self storage business. I've known people who've attempted to create funds wanting to get in in a big way. Most of the people I know have had experience in other realms of real estate, but I, I don't recommend this at all if this is your, your like getting in the self storage space. First of all, I've never seen anybody successfully do it, although somebody probably has, I've just never seen it. Secondly, my coaching is, do some syndications or do some joint ventures, get in the business, get a track record that you can point back to, a success story. It really helps if you've taken a project through the entire life cycle of a project that's all the way from building it or redeveloping it to stabilizing it to running it to selling it. it really helps if you're doing getting in what I'm calling the world of funds to have at least one or more go through the entire life cycle. Cycle, although you don't have to, but get in the business before you start going or considering going down this path. Now, for me, I was in the business. I'd done a number of syndications, and I I thought that, and rightly so, that creating a fund would allow me to grow faster, exponentially faster. Now, I did what many of you do. I went out and got a coach. I ended up paying five times more per month than what I charge people, but I ended up getting a coach and we developed a strategy and it was actually a really unique, good strategy. What my coach ended up seeing was that if I'm going into this world of funds and we were going to raise money from money managers or other funds or hedge funds, that I was a real small fish swimming in an ocean of whales and sharks. And so his suggestion, and a really good one, was, okay, let's solve a pro let's create a fund that really solves a problem that money managers are having at the moment, create that fund, solve their problem, become a known entity in that particular world of, you know, raising money from money managers and family offices. A family office is nothing more than a money manager who manages a family's wealth, usually generational wealth, and that money manager's sole job is to invest and oversee the investments of that particular family's wealth. And his suggest what he saw was that, and it's true, my experience as a commercial real estate person, that a large percentage of 1031s are not successful. It's hard, especially in the boom years of, you know, 16 through 19, it, it was hard to find replacement property and the vast majority of 1031s were failing because we could, they couldn't find successful property. They were getting very high prices, I know this from my own experience, for your relinquished property, which you're selling, but we couldn't find anything worthwhile to replace it with. So one of the things a person can do is invest in a DST, a Delaware Statutory Trust. Now I'm not going to go into exactly what a DST is here. DSTs are a relatively recent phenomena and they emerged out of the, the 08 recession when TIFFs, which were the predecessor to DSTs were running into a lot of issues. So in a DST, I could sell a shopping center or a storage facility or something. And, and if I don't do a 1031, I can put my money in the DST. I defer my capital gains. All a DST does is, is it's like an LLC that can take money, 1031 money. And typically they offer lower returns. And his suggestion was take what you're doing and what you know how to do in the storage business, create a DST fund, become a known, you know, solve the money manager's problems, become a known quantity, then we'll come out with another fund that's just a normal self storage fund, but you'll be you'll be known at that point in this world. Seemed like a valid approach. 
is a valid approach, so we went to work. I was informed that the first thing I need to do is find a broker-dealer. Who's What is a broker-dealer? Well, in this world, I'm not selling membership shares. I'm selling a security. When you buy membership shares in the, this fund, you're literally buying a security. So I had to get a licensed security broker who technically every membership I sold or all the money I raised was going through him or that. Uh, broker dealer he was the broker dealer of record and I was selling securities into my fund then now to, to market to the money managers the money managers have a fiduciary and legal obligation to do a thorough due diligence on me my company and our fund and I discovered that how that's done, the money managers aren't going to do it, how the, how, but how they do that is they buy a report. And so my coach told me, in essence, there's two big companies that will do the due diligence for funds like this, and that you've got to engage one of the, hire one of those companies, run the due diligence on you so we can give this report to the broker dealers to satisfy their legal requirement to run their due diligence on you. So I had to outline all the syndications I had done up to that point, you know, the history, where we were in that, in the cycle of that particular syndication, and what the returns were, and basically what the due diligence people do is that they dive deeply into us, me, my company, and they look for where are the risks to potential future investors who are going to be dealing with this guy or this group of people. And the risks are usually in places like accounting procedures, operational procedures, financial reporting, employment procedures, how well we managed other people's money in our previous syndications, how well our reporting was, were there any complaints, our marketing practices, how we select and use vendors to run our businesses. Who, is our t who were our team members? Who did the accounting? Who did the CPA work? Who does the legal work? How well did they do it in our past syndications? Any legal issues any of our companies or syndications may have been in? Any legal issues any of the members of this fund have been in or are currently in? And they do a very thorough, believe me, very thorough background. It took weeks and weeks to go through this due diligence process with them. You know, I've been involved in a number of syndications that had different sponsors, different investor groups, different organizational structures, different reporting methods, different platforms investors went on to get their stuff. And I had to pull all of this together and create a comprehensive and digestible way for this due diligence company to see what we'd done. And we did it. Then I had to design a very specific type business plan for funds that institutional money managers can relate to. So once again, I hired somebody. I designed, you know, what our acquisition strategy it was, what our goal strategy was, uh, what a life cycle of a project would look like, you know, what our past performance had been. And I, but I hired somebody to write this business plan for me. Then you've got the legal work. Now, at this level, we're not using uh, the attorney that we've used for all our syndications. We're using a national, uh, nationally recognized uh, legal firm, happened to be out of San Diego, California, that my due diligence company was familiar with, that the uh, money managing world, the institutional world is familiar with, and they were reviewing all of our documents, coaching us along the way. That you know they would have our fund was going to be a Delaware you know LLC, a Delaware company, and it was estimated our legal costs to put this fund together is uh, was uh, slightly north of a hundred thousand dollars. Now for me, it was a 
I went real deep into it. I mean, we went to the point where we could have pulled the trigger on it. And ultimately, I decided not to go down that route after spending a lot of money. Uh, but that was more of a personal decision for me. So we were going to raise 20, 25 million dollars to go out and create a DST fund. And, you know, my corner of the storage world at that time, and for most part still is, we've done some other things since then, but was primarily doing conversions and expansions where I could do value add plays and generate certain types of returns. And one of the things I do every morning. I meditate in the morning, but I have a morning routine. And anytime I'm expanding my world, I always use this morning time to do my work. And one of the things I do when I'm really expanding my world, moving into something new, something unfamiliar, is one of the exercises I do, and we actually talk about this in the boot camp, is I sit down and I visualize my life in this world three years from now, five years from now, we've massively won. What does this, what does this life look like? And usually I'm visualizing what a day is like, how it feels, and usually it's a very positive experience and it motivates me to move forward and go through all the obstacles one has to go through to expand into a bigger world. But as I was doing this work for this fund, what I saw was the future I was creating for me really wasn't a future I was that excited about living into. It didn't excite me to be a fund manager. I like dealing in the storage world, and I like dealing with investors, and I like dealing with people like you who are getting in the storage world, but managing a fund really didn't excite me that much. And I knew how much what a challenge it was for me to take $5 million at that time and go out and do some deals to hit the returns I was used to. Now, I've seen a lot of fund managers. I've seen a lot of fund projections on projects where when things get tight, you'll adjust the income. You'll make the income go up 5% a year rather than 3%. Or you'll reduce the cap rate on the reversion cap rate to get that IRR up. There's a lot of things you can do with the Performa to generate the returns that you need. And my coach was telling me to do that because he said, whatever you put in your Performas, the, the fund managers that are reviewing what you're doing or going to change it so make it look real good on paper and I just knew what a challenge it was for me to deploy five million dollars I could imagine the kind of deals I might do if I had to deploy 25 million 30 million dollars in a 12-month period which is what I was committing to do with this fund now that was just me. There's nothing that I'm not saying fund managers are doing anything wrong or the people who create projections for funds are doing anything wrong. I'm just saying that as I did my work, I saw that was not a business that I wanted to create. That was not a future I wanted to live into. So I walked away from it. Later on, a year or two later, I looked, revisited the whole thing again. This time, just thinking about doing a regular storage fund. And once again, as we got closer and closer to it, I decided not to pull the trigger on that. Now that was just me. That was just my personal decision. Had I been, had I started this younger, and been a little, or a little more aggressive, I'd probably be in the fund business right now. I just, it was a personal decision for me, so I don't want to persuade you not to do it. I'm not saying you shouldn't form a fund. I'm just explaining to you the process I went through. Three episodes ago, we talked about what a, typically what a fund organizational structure and the splits with the investors might look like. I don't want to repeat that here. You can go back and look at what a fund, you know, typically the sponsors own 20% of the fund. Um, and there's all kinds, it's fee driven to a large degree just a different world than I wanted to play in.
Now, perhaps you want to do a syndication with individual investors, not institutional investors, and create a blind pool. I've done that. That's a good, that's another approach you can do. I wouldn't recommend doing that as a way to get into business. I would do some one off deals first, get a track record, then investors can look at something, look at you, look at your history in the business and feel more comfortable writing you a check to go buy something as opposed to invest in a deal. But no matter which direction you go, if you're using other people's money, whether you do syndications, whether you do joint ventures, whether you create funds, get a good team together to support you, and own that corner of the self-storage world and the fundraising world that you're gonna that you're gonna traffic in. Own it. This world of self-storage has a bright future ahead of it. More and more people are using it. It's becoming a known quantity and the industry is maturing. There is a lot of consolidation going on and for us smaller investors there will be a lot of profit to be made over the next decade as this industry matures and it's a fun world to play in. So thank you very much for viewing these episodes on fundraising. My name's Mark Helm. I'm the author of Creating Wealth Through Self-Storage and I look forward to being with you again soon.